Sly Cooper, Rise of Vexen. Chapter 2, Part 4. As she neared what seemed to be the center of the operation, Vexen noticed there were no guards anywhere, giving her an uncomfortable flashback. In the center of the room stood a table with someone strapped down, writhing in agony. The Duchess held her hands over the person, his screams slowly becoming metallic and hollow until they stopped. When the Duchess stepped aside, a piece of machinery sat in his place. No sooner had that happened than someone wheeled the machine part out and another person was brought in to be strapped down. The Duchess caressed the terrified man's face with the back of her hand after the last strap was put in place. Don't worry. I'll help stop your life of crime. Permanently. She whispered to him, reaching to a control board beside her. Images of when Vexen almost had her mind scrambled by the Contessa came to mind. The memory caused her legs to become weak. Her hands shook and her heart pounded faster, causing her ears to ring. Clenching her fist and taking a breath to calm herself, Vexen jumped down from her vantage point, startling the Duchess. Oh, it seems that we have a little lost puppy, she said smoothly, turning around and crossing her arms. Vexen said nothing, slowly reaching down to her leg, but once again reminding herself she no longer carried her shock pistol. You must be the thorn in the master's side I've been hearing so much about. Vexen grit her teeth and clenched her fist when she saw the man strapped down and his prison uniform. His eyes were wide with terror as he tried to quietly struggle free. What have you been doing to these people? Vexen demanded. The Duchess grinned and looked at the man over her shoulder. Oh, him? <laughs> Your inferior mind can't comprehend what is being done here. The Duchess haughtily replied. Vexen stood straight and shifted her weight to one leg, placing a hand on her hip. Indulge me. The Duchess sighed with an irritated breath, walking to the far side of the room, allowing Vexen to silently step to the table in the center of the room. Very well. I'll dumb it down so you can understand. I heard of the Contessa's conquest while she was part of Interpol. When I heard she retired, I wanted to take her place and looked up her real estate firm. It took some time, but eventually I wore her down to teach me her methods. I took what I learned and enhanced the techniques with my own powers of transformation. My master found me soon after and introduced me to Leon Rousseau. Rousseau's forging affinity allowed us to find prisoners that were being transferred and redirect them here. The Duchess turned around sharply, startling Vexen as she straightened, hiding away her hand from trying to undo one of the straps. Those prisoners were then given to me, and I turned them into machines for making Damascus steel. But we need more of this steel quickly, and if you interfere, my master will be very put out. The Duchess ominously raised her hand, her sharp, claw-like nails ringing as she opened them wide. So before that happens, I'll make sure that he never knows you were here in the first place! Almost before Vexen could react, the Duchess was upon her, bringing down her hand hard. <laughs> Vexen barely managed to jump back, avoiding the sharp claws as they slammed into the ground, pits forming in the concrete. Using her nightwalk, Vexen flashed to another part of the room jumping back when the Duchess' claws came down again. The Duchess swung back, her fingertips whistling. Vexen jumped back again to avoid them, but ran into the wall and ducked down. Sparks sprayed into the air as the Duchess hit the metal where Vexen's neck had been a moment before. The huge spider woman flew back into the opposite wall when Vexen drove her feet into her chest. Vexen rushed to her and swung her leg hard into her head, throwing the spider across the room again. Vexen unleashed another powerful kick, hurling the Duchess into yet another wall. Ah! She sprinted after her, only to have her foot caught by the Duchess with a loud, frustrated shout, swiping her claws down hard. Vexen managed to avoid the first swipe, but the second caught her off guard, grazing the top of her arm, tearing through the fabric, and leaving claw marks on Vexen's bicep. <gasps> the sting made Vexen coddle it when her arm began to feel heavy and stiff. What? 
What did you put on those blades of yours? She demanded. The Duchess laughed and held up one of her arms. Vexen hissed, pulling her leg from the spider's grip and backing away, trying to clench her hand but to no avail. On them? Darling, please. That is no ointment. That is my power. I can turn you into a part of a machine with just a touch. But this will be quicker. The Duchess shouted, her eyes becoming wide as a beam of energy shot out. Vexen dove away, but the bottom half of her right leg was caught by it. Just like her arm, her leg began to feel stiff and heavy as if it had fallen asleep. I can't let that beam hit me, she thought, noting that for a short time while the Duchess used her beam, she didn't move. I'll have to get her while she's using that beam. It's my only shot. Vexen struggled to get to her feet again, especially with her numb leg. The Duchess came rushing at Vexen many more times, and when she began using her beam, Vexen used her nightwalk to get closer. She planted a hard kick into the Duchess' head, throwing her to the ground. The Duchess tried to hit Vexen with her claws or beam, but the giant spider woman would be thrown to the ground each time. Leon sighed, putting down his wine and looking over the prisoner transfer forms before him, sighing in agitation as he heard screams. Uh, can't she keep those inmates quiet? He yelled at the door, picking up his pen and filling out the form, and then looking over an officer's signature, expertly swinging the pen through the letters. It wasn't exact, but it was close enough that any police officer would accept it without hesitation. Screams and, this time, sounds of falling equipment made Leon growl, snatching the glass of white wine and angrily walking to the Duchess workstation. Would you please keep it? As he rounded the corner, instead of seeing the spider hunched over an inmate, he saw her engaged with what appeared to be a fox. Quickly he ran back to his office, slammed and locked the door, and began dialing his rotary phone. Master, she's here, he shouted. Calm yourself, Russo. Is the next batch of prisoner transfer documents ready? Y yes but what do we do about her? <sighs> Assist Duchess in disposing of her. If she slows the steel production, I'll be very put out. I'm sending armed agents your way. <sighs> Kill her if need be, the voice said, hanging up shortly after. Leon grit his teeth, throwing down his wine glass and opening the drawer of his desk, where a small blue button sat. The operation has been compromised. If Vexen is here, then they are already on the Master's trail. And if Duchess is defeated, the machinery will revert. The least I can do is give myself some time to escape, he muttered to himself, pressing the button as a timer above his door began to count down. Duchess was always so annoying. She will be missed. He sighed, grabbing a few riding tools, tossing aside his smoking jacket for a parka, and running for the main entrance. With one final solid hit from Vexen, after both her arms were utterly useless and her right leg began to look like a steel eye beam the Duchess was knocked out. Instantly, the effects on Vexen wore off, and she could finally move freely again. I'm glad that's over with. Now to find Adora's father, she thought to herself, freeing the prisoner, then walking through the double doors she had seen the previous inmate taken through. As she walked, she could hear the sounds of machinery slowing down replaced with pained groans and shouts. Rounding the corner revealed row upon row of bubbling vats containing molten metal. Beside them, hundreds of machine parts looked to grow faces, arms, legs, and torsos. Some broke free from their mounting points and ran away, while others lay on the ground, slowly regaining their previous forms. Vexen took a wide stance at the door and reached to her thigh, the running inmate skidding to a stop in various stages of reversion. All right, all of you, put your hands 
but she stopped herself when her hand once again missed her pistol, reminding her that she was no longer the agent she had known. All of you, get out of here as fast as you can. The cops will be here soon. She shouted instead, cringing as so many criminals ran past her. Vexit, come in! Those reinforcements are almost here! Whatever you're doing, you need to move fast! Murray tried to stop them, but he had to run! Ryu tried slowing them down too, but he only got one truck! I know, I know! I'm moving as fast as I can, but I don't see Adora's father anywhere! She shot back. My scans are showing that the dark matter flow regulator is within a few feet of you. It looks like this. Bentley radioed. A picture of a valve with four curved arms surrounding the middle appeared in Vexen's field of view when a metallic voice echoed through the entire building. Adora? You know where my daughter is? Vexen lowered her stance and shot into the shadows, looking around to see where the voice had come from. The voice sounded tired and robotic, but chuckled. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to hurt you. I heard you talk about my daughter and was surprised that you knew her. I've never seen you before, and any police database I have access to doesn't show you, the voice said. Vexen swallowed hard as she came out from her hiding spot, still looking around for where the sound was coming from. That's my father's voice. See if you can find where he is. Adora shouted over the calm, making Vexen wiggle her pinky in her ear. I am in the back. Keep following the aisle you are on. I'm behind the last vet. The voice said again, as pale blue light flickered at the end of the row. What greeted her was almost enough to make her gut turn. Embedded in the wall was a red panda, surrounded by and infested with wires and metal tubes. Circuits and plates were stuck to his face, and one of his eyes had been replaced with a camera. His hand stuck out of the wall at the wrist, and what skin remained was infested with wires. Hello there. I take it you are the one that knows Adora? He asked, his head turning to her with the sound of actuators humming. Yes. I actually came here on a mission of my own, and was asked by Adora to find you. Are you Meredoth Hark? Vexen replied, looking over what he had become. Ah, uh, that sounds like Adora. Yes, I am him. He smiled, looking away from her, seeming to be rooted in thought. Vexen, let me talk to my father. D just put the shades on his face. Vexen agreed, taking the shades from her face and placing them on Murdoch, while passively listening as the two of them talked in German. Something in the distance caught Vexen's ear, cueing her to sink back into the shadows away from the door's vantage point. As she waited silently, she could see rifle-mounted lights swaying back and forth on the floor and the organized sounds of boots trampling through the storage area. When Murdoth was satisfied, he caught Vexen's attention, allowing her to take back the shades. Vexen has an ice ring to it. Listen. There has been a self-destruct sequence in motion. I have done my best to keep it from counting down as I watched you knock out Duchess. Vexen's eyes went wide when she heard the news of a self-destruct and began frantically looking for a way to move him. Listen, Meredoth, I came here to get you out, and that's- It's no use, Vexen. I was Duchess's first attempt at transformation. As you can see, it was not the best of outcomes. When I watched Duchess go down and the others begin to regain their form, I hoped that I would too. But as you can see, that is folly. Most of what you see here was an attempt to keep me alive. Sounds of the soldiers moving closer made both of them look over as the lights came nearer. I can't leave, but take this. He said as a disc spit out from what appeared to be a disc drive in his chest. Give that to Adora. What about the dark matter? I don't see it anywhere, Bentley! I think he means this. Murdoth interrupted, using his eyes to point to the part embedded into what little flesh remained. It is part of my cardiovascular system, but I won't be needing it anymore. 
take it and go. What? Just take it. I can only hold off this self-destruct for about 20 more seconds. He urged. Vexen took the disc, grabbing the valve and pulling with all her might. The sounds of flesh tearing and bones cracking heard over the scream of pain. With one final heave, the valve was pulled free. Murdoch slumped and Vexen could only stare in horror. This isn't how Sly would have done things. He would have found a way to bring him home. But the sad realization that she couldn't do anything about it struck her when Murdoch looked at her with bitter rage and shouted, Laufen Sie, dummes Mädchen! Vexen didn't understand his words, but understood his feeling, turning and running as fast as she could back through the factory as tears stung the corners of her eyes. Murdoch grinned darkly as the soldiers neared him, their rifles trained on his face as the countdown on a small screen beside his head approached zero. Lebe wohl, Blasserreiter. Lebe wohl, he muttered, closing his eyes as the counter hit zero and a high explosive charge detonated on one of the vats. A flood of molten metal surged from the tank, enveloping the nearby soldiers. Vexen felt the ground shake and dared a glance behind her to see the river of molten slag coming. Her legs were already tired from the fight with the Duchess. Her lungs burned and her chest felt like it would explode, but she had to keep running. As she rounded the last few corners, Vexen remembered the door needed a key card to open from both sides. But with the river of death behind her, there wouldn't be time to open the door. She did the next best thing she could, grabbing a guard's rifle and began shooting out the keypad. As she ran, Vexen felt a rush come over her, and everything seemed to slow to a crawl. Six well-placed shots shorted out the pad and unlocked the door, bursting through it. She ran a few steps before collapsing in the snow near Ivan, who picked her up and ran back to the safe house. Not long after he disappeared into the snowstorm, Darius and a trained SWAT team walked through the snow and up to the front of the building. Within seconds, the footprints left by Ivan had filled in with snow. Team 1, Team 4, spread out and search. Team 2 and 3, search around the building. I'm sure you'll find something. If not, get to the roads leading out and stand guard. Nothing in, nothing out. Darius commanded as the SWAT gave a grunt and left for their assignments. Meanwhile, Darius walked up to the cooling slab of swirled black and gray metal, swinging his hand through the outer layer and hurling a glob at a nearby sign, ignoring the searing pain and peeling flesh of his hand. I thought I told you to be finished within the week. He growled, turning his eyes to Duchess Alcina as she limped up to him, her clothes tattered and burnt. The little witch was getting in the way. Besides that, she has a wicked right kick. The Duchess' words became nothing more than grunts, as Darius grabbed her by the throat and slammed her into the wall nearby the bubbling puddle of metal. Leaning in close, Darius sneered between his teeth as something looked to rise from his shoulders in the shape of wings. I don't want to hear your excuses. I asked you to make me a large enough order of Damascus steel to make three, but you've only given me enough to make one. Now all of this is in ruins because you couldn't take care of one little fox. He sees. Dropping her to the ground, causing two of her legs to step into the metal. The Duchess shrieked in pain as Darius slammed his fist into the side of her head, throwing her into the street and knocking her out. With a hard breath, he calmed himself, straightening his hair and tie, then drug the Duchess into the SWAT truck, a pair of cuffs firmly around her arms. Leon may have escaped for now. But I'll catch him sooner than later. Darius sneered to himself, slamming the doors shut and patting the side of the truck. If one was all he had the materials to make, then one was all he would use. After a minute or two, the sting of his hand began to irritate him, calling to one of the SWAT members for a bandage and painkillers.
The gang scrambled as best they could, deleting all their programs and wiping the routers before getting Vexen and disappearing from town to hide. Once Vexen recovered, she sat with Adora in the van while Bentley decoded the disc given to Vexen by Murdoff. Adora, I'm sorry for not- Vexen, don't. I know you did all you could searching for my father, and I thank you with all my heart. He told me there was no way he'd be able to return. Something in Dutch's experiment had gone wrong and turned him into that thing. He was more machines than alive and cutting him from the power supply would have killed him. Adora murmured, closing her eyes as tears stung the edges. Vixen sighed and set a hand on her shoulder when Ivan walked up to them. Bentley has corrected. Vixen and Adora stood, filing into the warm van and closing the side door. Murray was already asleep in the driver's seat, sometimes snoring loud enough that the sides of the van would vibrate. Your father was a genius, Adora. But I managed to get past his encryptions and found this packet for you, he said, pushing up his glasses and tapping enter. What appeared to be short movies began playing across the screen, each of them from a first person's view. Some depicted Adora as a child, while others showed Adora, her mother, and her father playing in a field. What are these? They are his memories. Adora breathed, wiping a tear away as each of the movies played all of them staying silent until Murdoch's face appeared. But this time, it wasn't the twisted horror that he had become. It was his face. Hello to you. If you have successfully decoded this disc, you should see these memories. I know I may seem strange, but this was all I had time for. From what I had access to, I was able to find that whoever is running this facility is trying to build a mechanical automaton. This machine requires huge amounts of Damascus steel. Additionally, numerous orders for high-end technology were made to an unlisted tech firm. Images of order sheets came up on the screen, some including orders for circuit boards, chips, processors, and capacitors. I was integrated into the main computer regulating the production of this alloy because of my extensive metallurgical knowledge. Bentley crossed his arms and huffed. For everything he's saying, Murdoch hasn't told us anything about what he's trying to get at, he shouted, making Murray snort. Let him keep talking. I'm sure he will make his point soon, Adora urged, listening to the recording. I performed a self-diagnostic, only to find that the components within my body were custom-made. They are designed to harness not only massive amounts of computing power, but also something else that I couldn't identify. Diagnostic scans came up on the screen, making Bentley sit up and look them over, rubbing his chin in thought. Again, I have limited access in this body, but I did manage to find the company making these components is located a few miles south of Tokyo, Japan. I'm sorry if this information is rudimentary at best, but it was all I had to offer. Farewell, Adora. You will have these memories and so much more for as long as you keep this disc. Murdoch's face winked off the screen, leaving the pictures and diagnostic information. Bentley searched the disk for any sign of the video file to replay it, but scan after scan revealed that no such video file ever existed on the disk. Well, that was strange. I've never had a ghost file like that. I've heard of a ghost drive, but never a ghost, uh... Bentley was stopped when Vexen put a hand on his shoulder, pointing him to where Adora was standing with the disk in her hand holding it to her chest. It, it was my father just saying goodbye, she said, tucking the disc away in her pocket. What do the diagnostics say, Bentley? Ivan asked, trying to make sense of the line upon line of technical words displayed on the screen. Well, let's have a look here. Yes, well, that goes there. Oh, it's a subnet route with a Trojan... No, 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 that can't be right. 
but... Bentley looked closer at the code as he scrolled through it, taking in everything that he saw until he reached the end, staring at the final line of the diagnostic. Key transference equals true. Bentley sat back in his chair, pushing off his hat as he rubbed his head. This isn't any ordinary tech. Someone is trying to create a computer that could use magical abilities. The only time we had any kind of magical encounters was when the Contessa tried to wipe Vexen's mind or when the Mask of Dark Earth attached itself to her face. Why would anyone need a computer like that? Vexen asked, moving her hand across the screen to a photo of an order form with a shipping address in Japan. This is all getting very strange for me, Ivan said, leaning away from the screen and holding his chin as he thought. I still have a contact in Japan that might be willing to help us. In the meantime, we can use my old safe house here to rest, Ivan said, walking to the street to ensure no one was around. How far away is it? I doubt Murray would be able to get us there, Bentley asked, pointing his thumb at Murray as he slept in the driver's seat. It is not far, just down this alley a bit, he said. Vexen and Ivan pulled Murray into the passenger seat and idled down the alley. They had a long journey ahead of them, and they would need their rest whenever they could get it. Thank you.